Good evening, councillors and officers and members of the public who have joined us in the uh, council chamber this evening and those watching us online. Welcome to the October meeting of Crangamite Shire Council. I'd like to introduce councillors and staff who are with us here this evening. To my left is Deputy Mayor Geraldine Kennedy, Councillor Joe Beard, Councillor Jamie Vogels. To my right, Councillor Kate Macon, Councillor Nick Cole, our CEO, Mr Andrew Mason, Mr David Harrington, Manager of Corporate and Community Services, Ms Brooke Love, Manager of Works and Services, Mrs Justine Lindley, Manager of Sustainable Development, Mr Aaron Moyne, Manager of Planning and Building, and Mr Simon Bakeri, we welcome back to the Council Chamber as our Manager for Finance. Councillors, we begin with the prayer. We ask for guidance and blessing on this council. May the true needs and well-being of our communities be our concern. Help us who serve as leaders to remember that all our decisions are made in the best interests of the people, people, culture and the environment of the Krangamite Shire. Amen. Acknowledgement of country. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land around Krangamite Shire, the Eastern Ma and Wadawurrung people. We pay our respects to all Aboriginal elders and peoples past, present and emerging. Mr CEO, we have an apology this evening from Councillor Hickey. Are there any declarations of conflict of interest? Uh, through you, Mayor, I have two declarations of conflict of interest. The first is from Councillor Kennedy in relation to item 8.1, which is the planning item. Uh, and a declaration from Councillor Macon in relation to item 9.9, .9, which is the quick response grants. Thank you. Councillors, confirmation of minutes. Uh, the meeting held on the 27th of September 2022. Someone happy to move those minutes, please. Councillor Cole, do I have a seconder? Councillor Vogels. Is there any comments or questions on the minutes, councillors? All in favour? That's carried. <coughs> This evening we have uh, two citizenship ceremonies to conduct, so can I ask uh, Council to move to suspend standing orders for this, these ceremonies? Thank you, Councillor Cole and Councillor Macon. All in favour? Carried. Okay, Councillors, if you'd like to move down while we conduct the... Have a look at see your families. They want to take part in this as well. This is very exciting. Amory's from the Philippines and Chloe is from the United Kingdom. So welcome to you both. This is very exciting in anyone's life, so don't be nervous. It will uh, it'll all be okay. <laughs> the citizenship ceremony has been conducted as prescribed in the Australian Citizenship Act 2007 and the Australian Citizenship Regulations 2016. Under the authority of the Minister for Immigration, Citizenship, Migrant Services and Multicultural Affairs. As Mayor, I've been authorised as a person who may receive the pledge as a citizen of the Commonwealth of Australia. Making the pledge is the final step in you becoming an Australian citizen. And I have a couple of messages to read. The first one is from the Honourable Andrew Giles MP, the Minister for Immigration, Citizenship and Multicultural Affairs. Thank you for deciding to become an Australian citizen. Today you join a nation that is one of the most successful multicultural societies, with around half of all Australians either born overseas or with at least one parent born overseas. In Australia, everyone can be proud of who they are and everyone should be respected, valued and feel a sense of belonging. We're privileged to share this beautiful country with the world's oldest continuing culture. This is a fundamental part of who we are. 
For more than 60,000 60, years, First Nations peoples have cared for country. Appreciating and understanding this truth is a vital part of what it means to be an Australian. Australians are united by a shared commitment to democracy and the rule of law and to freedom of speech, religion and association. Our diversity is our strength and we prosper by embracing this. We believe in a society in which everyone is equal, regardless of their gender, faith, sexual orientation, age, ability, race, national or ethnic origin. Ours is the land of the fair go, in which respect and compassion underpin our care for each other and our willingness to reach out to those around us in times of need. By becoming an Australian citizen, you make a commitment to these values and to contribute to our ever-evolving Australian story. On behalf of the Australian Government, heartfelt congratulations on becoming an Australian citizen. Andrew Giles. Now I need to re read to read Schedule 1 of the Australian Citizenship Regulations. Australian citizenship represents full and formal membership of a community of the Commonwealth of Australia. And Australian citizenship is a common bond involving reciprocal rights and obligations, uniting all Australians while respecting their diversity. Persons on whom Australian citizenship is conferred enjoy these rights and undertake to accept these obligations. A, by pledging loyalty to Australia and its people. B, by sharing their democratic beliefs. C, by respecting their rights and liberties. And D, by upholding and obeying the laws of Australia. That's all the preamble you'd like to know. So we'll go in alphabetical order. Amory, you're ready if you'd like to repeat after me. From this time forward under God, I pledge my loyalty to Australia and its people, whose democratic beliefs I share, whose rights and liberties I respect, and whose laws I will uphold and obey. Congratulations. After me, from this time forward under God, from this time forward under God, I pledge my loyalty to Australia and its people. I pledge my loyalty to Australia and its people, whose democratic beliefs I share, whose democratic beliefs I share, whose rights and liberties I respect, whose rights and liberties I respect, and whose laws I will uphold and obey, and whose laws I will uphold and obey. Congratulations. Some goodies for you to take away. Ask everyone to be upstanding for the national anthem, please. And I promise to move away from the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, people will be turning off their uh, computers when you're ready to stand.
Well, I was just going to ask if any. moment in the people's lives so it was great that we can all take part. Uh, to resume the meeting can uh, I have a councillor move a motion to resume standing orders please. Thank you councillor Vogels and councillor Kennedy. All in favour? Carried. Uh, Mr CEO deputations and presentations please. We have two. Uh, it's through you, Mayor. We have two. Uh, both are in um, relation to the planning item, item 8.1. Um, and so, did you want to, um, Councillor Kennedy? What? Oh, sorry, Councillor yes, Kennedy sorry. has a yes. conflict of interest. Thank you, Councillor Kennedy. Uh, uh, so, the, the uh, first uh, deputation is from Mr. David Shapiro. Um, on behalf of RA Futures, so. Thank you, Mr Shapiro. Thank you. Um, I'll try to be brief. Uh, I refer to our submission to Council regarding this matter. Um, in that submission, we tried to make it clear that um, in the event Council wanted to issue a permit regarding this matter, um, we felt that um, we had no issue with that uh, on the basis that there was formal acknowledgement that a wind farm would be in the vicinity and we suggested that that could be, um, that could be achieved via a, a section 173 agreement but council may well uh, determine that there's another solution to that land, uh, land use conflict. In any case our, our position is that um, uh, we've offered uh, formally and we'll offer again to um, move the turbines if the proponent can move the house location a little um, and we would pick up the costs associated with that in order to create a, a one kilometre separation uh, between the house location and the turbines. Thank you. Oh, thank, you. thank you, Mr Shapiro. The other uh, deputation is from the applicant, Mr. David Johnston. Thank you, Mr. Johnston. <coughs> Mr. 
Thank you for, is that right? Can you hear me? Thank you for allowing me to present my case for my farm workers planning permit. Firstly, I must apologise. On the 8th of September, my planner received a copy of noise and shadow flicker assessments. She mentioned it in a conversation which I had forgotten about. So, in fact, I requested that I get them passed on today. So, to Aaron and the planning staff, I'm very sorry about that. That was, I own that mistake and that's totally on my head. So, very sorry to put you through that. It is very important that you view my permit on its own merits and do not get confused with the wind farm permit. Our intention to build a farm workers' accommodation predated any knowledge of the proposed wind farm. My farm workers' accommodation permit was submitted to council prior to any application being received by RE Futures. Future, sorry. Part of the granting of a permit for workers' accommodation is to minimise the loss of valuable agricultural land by using minimal land. The Shire councillors and planners would have noted this on the site inspection, as well as they would have also noted access into our property is from a small country town, that small country road, and not an extremely busy gazetted Vic Roads road. I noticed in the council's report it stated the applicant, myself, has been unwilling to relocate the workers' accommodation to another location on the property. I am in the most suitable position on my property, as council has stated on page 19 of their report. The farm workers' accommodation is to encourage the retention of employees and population to support rural communities. The site was chosen back in 28th of March 2017 as per City Power Reference Number 306185084 as I paid for a power pit to be left on this site for when I felt in the future I need to employ labour so I could take a step back as I got near retirement age. This site has a bore and was actually the site of the old original dwelling. Make no mistake, this was well and truly in place before there was any mention of a wind farm facility. On the 17th of September, we requested a meeting with RE Future and told them of our plans for workers' accommodation. I showed them the site, they GPSed and photographed it. Photographed it. They also took a photo of the invoice, which was emailed to council yesterday. RE Future has not contacted me. They have not been open and transparent in any way. They've been, they have totally ignored our plans until they put their objection into council. I draw your attention to page 16, paragraph four. Make particular note of the wording. The assessment of this proposal is difficult and in the application for a wind energy facility is still going through review stage by DELP. The proposed layout and design may change. What right has anyone got not to give me a permit when I have paid a professional to submit it to council with everything required? What really concerns me is the last wording. The wind farm may change its design. Why not grant my permit as it is not a problem that they may change their design? With us building our farm workers' accommodation, we're not stopping the proposed Mumblin wind farm. They can move turbines so, do not, so they do not affect neighbouring property. I'd ask council not to adopt the recommendation of the planner but to do the right thing and vote on conscience. I do not know of any person in this room or any ratepayer in the Karangamite Shire who would like their land, their asset controlled by neighbouring farms. Maybe Tim's, Smith's, Caversands, the host farms are happy to let RE Futures dictate what happens to our land. 
thank you for giving me the opportunity to present my case. Thank you, Mr Johnston. Um, oh, we're about to deal with that matter, Mr oh, CEO. Oh, we're not doing minutes? We've done minutes. minutes. Okay, sorry. Okay. So, councillors, we will be dealing with this issue right now. So, it's item 8.1 Planning Permit Application PP 2021 191, the use and development of land for rural work accommodation at 16 Tony's Road, Eklund South. Mr. Moyne, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And through you, I present council with this report for Planning Permit Application PP 2021 4 191. The application seeks planning approval for the use and development of land for rural worker accommodation located within one kilometre of land subject to an application for a permit for a wind energy facility. The proposed rural worker accommodation will be used to support the agricultural use of the property as a beef farm and to provide the landowner with flexibility and resources to continue to operate the farm. The building will be located in the northeast section of the property with a 57 metre setback from the northern property boundary and 265 metres approximately from the northeast corner of the lot which adjoins Curdie's Leechfield Road. Uh, the built form will consist of three bedrooms, an open plan living and kitchen area with a total building height of 4.3 metres. Access to the worker accommodation is proposed and will need to be upgraded and provided from a vehicle crossover at Curdie's Leechfield Road via a new all-weather internal driveway. A planning application has been submitted to the Minister for Planning uh, on, adjo on adjoining land for the proposed Mumbling Wind Farm. The proposed wind farm as it currently stands will result in wind turbines located approximately 605 metres northwest and 790 metres east of the proposed worker accommodation. The proposed wind farm is still at an early planning application stage and has yet been publicly, publicly notified or put through a planning assessment process. Public notice of the application has been given and councillors received one objection from the wind farm proponent, RE Future. Issues raised in the objection relate to land use conflict and amenity impact uh, through to the future occupants through noise and shadow flicker. Relevant to the planning assessment of this application is Amendment VC212, approved by the Minister of Planning on 13th of October 2021, which, which introduced new permit requirements for accommodation uses including rural worker accommodation located within one kilometre of the nearest tidal boundary of land subject to an application uh, or a, a permit or an operational wind farm. The changes made by this amendment seek to minimise potential amenity impacts and land use conflict between accommodation uses and wind farms, including those proposed. In principle, the provision of rural worker accommodation to support productive agriculture and farming activity within the Shire is supported. However, planning assessment of this application has been complicated by the relatively uh, new planning controls for accommodation against a proposed wind farm at its early stage of planning assessment, which is yet to be notified, yet to have been notified and may be subject to further change. This creates a, a conflict and competing interests in planning decision making. Having regard to planning policy and controls which protect and promote renewable energy infrastructure and minimise potential amenity impacts and land use conflicts, in the vicinity of both proposed and approved wind farms, the application for rural worker accommodation can't be supported. The siting of the accommodation in close proximity to wind turbines associated with the proposed Mumbling wind farm is likely to lead, lead to land use conflict and amenity impacts to residents, an outcome which is discouraged by, discouraged by the Victorian planning provisions. The recommendations provided before you. Thank you, Mr Moyne, and I agree, it's certainly been a very complex application to deal with, and uh, yourself and, and uh, Ms Osborne O'Warn have done a, an amazing job. Councillors, there is a recommendation there from planning staff. Someone like to move the recommendation or an alternate recommendation? Um, Councillor Macon. Madam Mayor, through you, I'd like to uh, propose an alternative motion, please. Thank you. Um, so my motion is that the council, having caused notice of planning application of PP 2021-919, 
191, sorry, to be given under Section 52 of the Planning Environment Act 1987 and having considered all the matters required under Section 60 of the Planning Environment Act 1987, decide, decides to issue a notice of decision to grant a permit under the provisions of the Karangamite Planning Scheme in respect of the land known and described as Lot 2 LP144014, 16 Togneys Road, Eckland South, for the use and development of land of rural worker accommodation, subject to the eight conditions which are listed and which councillors have been previously circulated to uh, earlier. So, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Macon. <coughs> Do I have a seconder for that motion, please? Councillor Beard, thank you. Councillor Macon. I'd like to speak to your motion, please. Yes, please, if I may. Thank you. I'm through you, Madam Mayor. Um, I found this application was a very difficult decision as we are continually, continually being told to assess the application on the here and now and not what may happen in the future. So here and now we are struggling for key worker accommodation and this application helps to relieve this situation. Also, the assessment of this proposal is difficult in that the application for the wind en energy facility is still going through an initial review by DWELL and, has, and it has not been notified and the proposed design layout and outcome may still change. Agriculture is the primary driver in the local and regional economy and there is low availability and high demand for key work accommodation to support the continued operation and growth of agriculture in the Shire. The planning policy framework seeks to strengthen and support rural economic, economics and grow and diversify in the Great South Coast region. Agriculture is a key source of economic prosperity and contributing to the nation's food and fibre production. A key issue is the availability and affordable housing for workers in the Shire, which can create difficulties for businesses to attract employers operate and grow and I know personally that farmers who haven't had a holiday for three years because they can't find the workers to work their farm because they don't have the accommodation. And also when advertising for jobs a large percentage of applicants want to know is housing included in the package and if it isn't they won't be applying which in turn reduces the pool of applications. I feel we'll be visiting this issue in a lot more in the future and as I am sure, we will continue to be an issue for a lot more councils across the state. But they are future issues and we are dealing with the here and now. We need workers in the agriculture industry and we need them now. And we need to do what is possible to get these people in the industry to make sure that this industry continues to thrive and prosper. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Macon. Councillor Beard. Uh, speak to the thank you, Madam Mayor, and through you, um, as you um, acknowledged, I'd also like to acknowledge that um, it would have been tough work by our planning officer, um, Melanie O'Born, and planning manager, Aaron White. I appreciate the amount of effort and time you guys put into the assessments that you have to carry out and the reports that we receive and, are, and are obviously are provided with to help us inform our decisions. But um, I am going to second and agree with what Councillor Macon has put forward tonight. Um, and I always remember saying our number one rule um, when I've spoken to many people is that we have to take into account is what's in front of us. And speculation, which we often hear a lot of, particularly when we're dealing with on-site planning inspections, is that we can't deal with the speculation. We actually have to deal with what's in front of us. So the one word that always keeps sticking out to me is the proposed um, wind farm. And I, I just can't get past that, that it is proposed and Again, speculation that there, there could very well be a permit approved for that by the planning minister, but there may also not be. Um, so looking at the um, planning application that's before us now, um, it has been a difficult decision and um, it hasn't been tested yet. I think we are going to be the first council to have to deal with such an application considering there's been um, changes made to the state planning scheme and um, as only not recently as October last year. Um, so I know that we're going to be watched and this could be a bit of a you know test case, um, but someone had to do it and it'd be interesting to see where it goes to from here. But when you've got the state government on one hand saying that they're acknowledging and changing the farming zone um, requirements to protect the amenities of farming, uh, particularly with existing buildings against renewable energy projects, that they've actually stipulated in the farming zone how they want to protect agriculture 
and the amenity. So they're saying that on one hand, and then the other hand they're saying, hang on a minute, if there's actually a proposal um, put in for an application for a um, wind, wind energy facility, then you actually have to take that into account in anything you do. So I feel like we're in a rock and a hard space and it's, it's the guidelines are really tough to know how to navigate through this particular application. Um, but when we look at everything around our municipal, um, our, um, our municipal planning scheme, everything comes back to the fact that we back our agriculture. We back the fact that not only locally, but regionally we need rural worker housing to address not only, um, just, you know, the fact that, you know, farms can't change their, you know, their processes or, or change their practices, we also need to help keep that economy ticking over. And um, it is something that we've, we've really been struggling with. We're hearing about it all the time, that as Councillor Macon said, we just can't, we can't attract workers. And times have changed. People don't just want to live in a, a shack on a farm. They actually expect something decent. And this house, this proposed um, house or worker accommodation is, is really decent. It's actually um, very tasteful. If I had a young family, I'd be keen to come and live in it. So I can see why the applicants have chose such a design to help, um, I guess, look at diversifying what they can actually do on their farm, which is their right. So I think, um, as I said, when you look at our municipal planning scheme, which is our rule book, we back agriculture. It's our number one industry, um, not only here in Karangamite, but across the region. So it's just um, never been more important to reiterate that, um, that this is such a significant application that we have to look at. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, in saying that, um, I'd also like to say that um, being a, a primary economic driver locally and region, regionally, we need to remind ourselves that the low availability coupled with the high demand for key worker housing is a significant issue, as I stated before. We have a chance right here now to, I guess, put our hand up and say, well, we are concerned about that and we're wanting to address that and this is maybe one small step. But again, it's that speculation of a proposed wind farm that's going to hover above it. So. Um, again, I support um, the, recommend, uh, the alternate recommendation that Councillor Macon has put forward, um, but as I said, very difficult decision. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Beard. Councillors, further comments? Councillor Vogels? Thank you, Three Year Madam Mayor. Uh, first up, I'd like to um, just say that I also agree with um, Councillor Macon and, and Councillor Beard and, and have explained um, their thoughts very well. Um, it, it, this, this actually ticks every of our shire's uh, key worker housing strategies and, and would normally just just pretty much go through the system. Uh, so there's no overlays on the farm at the moment, or there wasn't, but there will be uh, at some later stage. And if they move the um, wind towers, there'll still be uh, overlays put across our farms and, and these guys' farms from, I think it's a kilometre around the wind tower. And then also from a kilometre from the boundary of the farm that the wind tower's on going across the, the neighbouring farm. Uh, there's a fair overreach going on um, with, with renewables. Uh, but on a farm, and I, from, from experience and stuff, the first question you'll get asked if you're trying to get a worker is, uh, where's the accommodation? And if there's no accommodation, there's no second question. There's, there's, no, there's no interview, there's where's the accommodation, no accommodation, or well, I'm not even coming for an interview. So it's extremely important if you want to have workers on. Um, and I believe that, that the applicants, um, they, they would start this process well before there was any mumblings of a, a wind farm on the horizon. So it sort of brings me um, along with these other guys. Um, just checking out what else I've scribbled down here, and oh, as I did did also read through the, all the information. I was, it's pretty disappointing uh, because a house on a farm is it, not a house on a farm. It's part of the farm. It's not. There's not. You haven't got a farm, and then you've got a dairy and a house and some fence and stuff. The whole kit and caboodle comes together to make a farm, and it's houses are working everything. It's, it's a unit that's put together, it's symbiotic, it's not separable. So it's extremely disappointing, um, what I read here, that farming is reduced in name to a competing and incompatible use 
of land and it's in conflict with renewable energy. Um, so disappointing that the agriculture is reduced to um, something that's just an incompatible use of land if they want to put renewables on. So that was disappointing. And, and I'll finish up with something I remember from when I was young that I read and it was um, roughly, uh, your livelihood, your liberty and your land are never safe when the legislators are in session. And it's never been more true. Thank you, Councillor Vogels. Any further comments, councillors? Councillor Cole. Um, Madam Mayor, thank you. I, I agree with the other three councillors. Um, it, it's very important, I think, that we have worker accommodation. We have we have a family that are wanting to build a house now for for accommodation. Um, it's it's in short supply throughout the country, let alone the Shire. Uh, getting people into this area, and this will help get another family in the area on a permanent basis um, and keep them there and, and, and make agriculture more sustainable and ongoing. So I'm also in favour of it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Meakin, do you want to sum up? No, thank you. I think everything's been said. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I don't think there really is anything else to be said, so I'll put it to a vote. All those in favour? It's carried. Thank you, Mr. CEO. Can you grab Councillor Kennedy, please? Hello. Item nine point one is the annual report twenty twenty one twenty twenty two. And quite unusually, um, I get to introduce this item. I'm delighted to present the 2021-2022 annual report to Council. For a large part of the past year, Council operated under continuing COVID conditions. Indeed, our first case in Corangamite was reported in late September 2021. We've certainly come a long way since then. However, I'm proud that the organisation delivered 85% of the annual action plan initiatives which was a fantastic effort considering the conditions. Highlights for the year were many, but to name some important ones was the fact that Crangamite Shire had one of the highest vaccination rates in Victoria. $7 million was spent on the local road network. The Timboon Town Centre activation project was finalised. Stage one of the Cobden Streetscape was completed with stage two budgeted for this year. Construction of the rail trail continued and a commitment of $5.6 million was made by the Federal Government for the Port Campbell Streetscape project. Timboon Township and the Lakes and Craters Tourism Campaign received state awards. $2 million was received for the unlocking housing projects at Simpson and Timboon. New lights were completed at the Skipton Recreation Reserve. And 3,380 tonnes of waste was diverted from landfill. Council adopted a number of policies and plans, including importantly, a gender equity action plan. A community flagpole was installed at the Civic Centre and the first flag was, was flown on Ida Hobbit Day in May. For the first time in a number of years, our population decline slowed and in fact has risen slightly. With highlights always comes challenges as well. And apart from the obvious impact of COVID on our physical and mental health, as well as enduring lockdowns and restrictions, it created challenges that we didn't anticipate. These include the pressure on housing stocks with people relocating from the metropolitan areas to the regions. This saw a dramatic increase in house prices across the Shire, a lack of available rental stocks, and the need to identify and rezone land for residential use in Camperdown, Cobden and Terang. It was good to see the work on the Cobden Structure Plan get underway. There's also the rising cost of materials and resources and access to contractors, as we saw when the tender from Port Campbell Streetscape Works failed to attract a bid last December. Workers are desperately needed <coughs> for the agricultural industry, but also in tourism now that visitors are able to return. During the year, we farewelled a number of our staff members, including David Ray, Director of Corporate and Community Services, and Adam Taylor, Manager of Finance. We also prepared to farewell the Corangamite Regional Library Corporation on the 30th of June after a long collaboration with our neighbouring councils. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank my fellow councillors for their contribution and dedication to their roles over the past 12 months. We have a co cohesive team in place with diverse views that are always considered with the greatest respect. 
At Corangamont, we're very fortunate to have a fantastic staff who go, often go above and beyond to serve our communities, and I thank them wholeheartedly. I'm grateful to CEO Andrew Mason providing, for providing outstanding leadership of his, this team and for providing wise advice to the councillors. Congratulations to everyone on achieving so much in a difficult year. Thank you, councillors. We have a recommendation. I would like to move the recommendation that council consider the annual report. Thank you, Councillor Kennedy. Anybody else? Councillor Cole, thank you. I had a feeling that was going to happen. I put my hand up too. You've Councillor Kennedy, would you like to speak to the motion? Thank you, Madam Mayor, and through you. Um, thanks for that very comprehensive report. Uh, I'm actually really proud um, of the rate of completed action, actions that we achieved um, in an environment that was challenged by COVID fallout um, and then the new challenges that emerged post uh, the lockdowns in the form of staffing shortages and recruitment, um, contractor availability, um, supplies and rising costs. Um, they really did uh, make achieving our goals um, much more challenging and harder than they would otherwise be. And of course, you know, that did lead to some deferrals um, of you know, actions that we had uh, in mind for uh, the year end of 21, uh, 22 rather, and, um, and some uh, resourcing um, and some actions were unfunded. So I feel like that we did well, we invested well in our roadworks um, at $7 million. We adopted our 10 year roadside management plan and kept a strong focus on improving the condition of our local roads, even though rising costs um, made that challenging and, and um, we weren't able to do as quite as many kilometres as we, we would have liked, but uh, we, we did really well there. Um, we com completed or commenced projects that will encourage our population and encourage growth and investment in Corangamite. And I think that's something really, really important that we've been able to do. We got $2 million for this, um, from the state government towards unlocking the housing projects in Timburn and Simpson, and we're preparing to begin on those subdivisions and infrastructure works um, for those projects. This is really timely, so timely, um, with the demand for residential and housing working that we have at the present time. Uh, sorry, worker housing. Sorry, I got that back to front, didn't I? <laughs> um, and we are very well placed now to cater to that demand and support jobs and major industries in Corangamite. So I'm really proud of that. Um, Mayor Gastrain uh, pointed to some other projects that, uh, that we've been able to achieve. Um, I won't repeat those again. Um, I'm happy, you know, that we got that funding. Oh, sorry, we haven't got it yet, um, but there's been an announcement for funding for upgrades to towers, the t mobile phone towers at Newark and Eklund. Um, that will make an enormous difference uh, to businesses in those areas and also to our agricultural uh, industry and tour in tourism industries as well. We were able to get people out and about again. Um, we funded 15. Um, events uh, in, from our events and festivals grants program uh, for $65,000. I think that was, that was you know, really great. It got people out, got them enjoying themselves again. Um, you know, obviously the, um, the businesses that staged those events got the benefit from that as well. And you know, I know that the new um, 16 kilometre section of the Child Apostles Trail is, is getting really great use uh, and it's, it's been a real um, asset to Corangamite and uh, I think that can only get better. I'm really pleased too that um, we maintained um, a good level of community satisfaction through our engagement and consultation um, with our recreational facilities and our support services. Uh, also our emergency and, and disaster management and you know we got to see a repeat of that very recently and uh, you know it's it, it obviously showed us again just how important it is to have planning in place for that um, to have uh, good management when it comes to to dealing with um, a disaster and and also with the recovery from it 
We really do um, value highly the delivery of services to our community and the maintenance and improvement of our assets. And we do appreciate any feedback that we get from the community and um, what we can learn from that. Um, we had um, environment grants. I mean, we, we do uh, think about our environment and that's something that we're conscious of. You know, we want to improve it, um, uh, make it better, uh, you know, um, create uh, interest in it and, um, you know, make sure that we're taking that in the right direction. So, you know, we, we had great success with our environment grants, which were oversubscribed by $23,000 plus. So, you know, that was an incredible response uh, and, you know, also shows how people do value uh, that grant program. Well, we didn't get everything done that we planned for the 2021-22 you know, year, um, but I observed real dedication and determination within the organisation to reach the benchmarks that we'd set. And the teams delivering the community services you know, tried so hard to maintain those services in the face of severe staffing shortages and recruitment challenges and were genuinely concerned for the recipients of those services. So I, I want to especially acknowledge and thank the senior office group and everyone in the organisation for you know, the amazing work that they did and how genuinely they applied themselves to the task that they had ahead of them because it was going uphill you know, for a lot of that time. You know, the pressures that I've mentioned, they haven't gone away and they'll continue to challenge uh, our ability to deliver services and to complete projects. And further pressures are coming to bear in the planning arena with multiple renewable energy projects prospecting in the Shire with potential for over-concentration and adverse impacts. So, you know, we've got, we've got a bit to deal with in front of us. But I have to say for the 2021-22 year, I'm really pleased with what has been achieved and that our budget has been managed to a surplus of 6.887 million. Um, in addition to that, uh, I do want to acknowledge the leadership of our Mayor, Ruth Gustrain, and our CEO, Andrew Mason. Um, you've both exhibited um, exemplary leadership and uh, we're really grateful for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kennedy. Councillor Cole. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I endorse Councillor Kennedy's remarks completely. Um, uh, I acknowledge uh, or state that I think a lot of the things we've done this year have been some of them, no, there's no really big whiz bang, look if you do things, but a lot of small things which a lot of communities just want small things done and that makes life in the country a lot better, a lot more livable and um, just getting on with business and we've delivered quite a few of those little things, um, lights lights, and etc around the shire. Um, one of them is that I congratulate Tim Boone on their civil ward in their top tourism town. Um, it's just a sign of great little community doing great things and, and being positive and looking towards the future and they've been rewarded unfortunately with silver they should have got gold perhaps the, perhaps that committee that selected them was wasn't uh, anyway uh, <laughs> um, the other thing that I think it maybe falls slightly outside the annual report but uh, the Kranger might I, I think the Krang might staff officers and staff members have done a fabulous job up at Skipton with the floods, um, they were up there. They've done a lot of work sandbagging, looking after the community. The early warning system that's been put in a place up there with the flood warnings really was a, a saviour. It gave them a, a bit more time to um, get ready and know what was coming. So it took a bit of the guesswork out of their system, gave them that surety and they knew how to prepare for it and probably saved quite a bit of time, money, effort and heartache um, and the staff were up there there were high visibility jackets around everywhere fixing things virtually the day after they were there before it helping set up but afterwards too they were there up there fixing it up and sorting it out and getting it back to work in order again there's still a lot of work to do um, 
I'm oh, sorry I couldn't be there on the Saturday when we had the super clean up. I had a, another engagement um, that, that happens. Um, but the staff have done a wonderful job and the officers concerned as well. So I congratulate all the workers, the sharp people. Thank Thanks, you. Councillor Cole. And there'll be a report, as we know, coming shortly on the floods. Is there further comments on the annual report, Councillor Beard? Um, through you, Madam Mayor, I, I know you're waiting for me to say what I'm about to say because I think as long as you've known me, um, I say it every time. And for those of you that don't know, um, this is the, my favourite document that we pull together um, year after year. Um, so as a council, we obviously set the council plan when we start our journey together, but it's the organisation as a whole that actually execute that plan. This is our report card to a degree. This is a way that as an organisation, we actually get to show the community what we've done, what we've achieved, but more importantly, um, it's the organisation as a whole that's achieved that. And I think our staff particularly don't get the recognition, particularly in the community. They don't often get, people don't often get to see what, what our staff actually always do. Um, whereas here it is in black and white. I actually always make sure I get a hard copy or I produce a hard copy because I actually love flicking through it. I, I have in the past years been said to have fed it to my kids in terms of making sure they have a look at it. Um, but if there is ever a document um, to reflect the work that gets done by your local government uh, municipality, then, then this is the one. Um, we have a great reputation in local government across the state. We're only down in Melbourne a couple of weeks ago with our um, fellow councils um, at the state conference. And Krangamite really does have a great reputation that ha really has with, withstood the test of time. Those things don't just happen. Um, and as a councillor, I'm really proud to be able to say that I'm from Krangamite. And this is why, because you look at the amount of work that we do, and even the politicians say they're happy to give us money because we actually get the work done, we deliver. Um, and I'd like to think that our communities appreciate that. Obviously, our community satisfaction survey had been um, acknowledged before, but that stuff really does mean a lot to us. Um, but there's projects in this annual report that haven't just happened overnight. There's been years of advocacy, not only by this council, but previous councils, even potentially before my time. Um, and, you know, Meg Stone will attest to that, that things don't happen quickly, unfortunately. That's probably one of the most frustrating parts. So I can imagine how our communities feel. But if, um, if ever you wanted to just have a catch up on what's been happening, this is certainly the document to do that. I too want to um, thank um, the CEO and his leadership with the organisation. But to Mayor, um, to you, Ruth, thank you for your leadership. You are so dedicated in what you've done year after year and um, and I think that needs acknowledging because a lot of what you said in your report you've been part of right from the start so thank you thank for you. what you do. Thank you. Thank you Councillor Beard and I shouldn't let that moment go past without congratulating you on your 10-year councillor award at the MAV conference <laughs> um, even if it was a, a year and a bit late due to COVID so <laughs> thank you. Yes that was a, a great event. Uh, is there further comments on the annual report, councillors? No. Oh. Councillor Vogels. Uh, just quickly, I don't have to single anyone out because for, from top to bottom, um, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff being achieved, as everyone's attested to, and, and from top to bottom, and it, it doesn't just happen easy. Uh, there's a lot of times when, it, when, it's, when it's extremely hard for the staff and, and you guys as directors and, and all the way down, but it's the grit and determination to just keep pushing, to head down, bum up, and, and, and make sure it's achieved. Because uh, I know you've all got um, the community uh, wellbeing at heart. And uh, I, know, I know a lot of times there's just too much to do, but you get it done, and we're all grateful for that. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Vogels. If there's nothing further, councillors, put the to a vote. All in favour? Carried. Item 9.2 is the finance report for September 2022. Mr Bicari, please. Thank you, through you, Madam Mayor. Uh, this report is to note Council's current financial position at 30th of September and to approve the changes to the 22-23 review budget that have resulted from a quarter of the quarterly review of the operations by Council staff. Um, Council, as a breakdown of those budget changes is on page 116. 
Um, you'll note there the majority of the capital changes is the allocation of government's LRCI funding, and the majority of the operating changes um, is due to an additional allocation from the Victorian Grants Commission of around $439,000. So, councillors, the, the net effect of those budget changes is favourable, <coughs> just under $461,000, uh, which, is, which is good news. Um, so, councillors, the recommendation is on page 107. Thank you, Mr. Bicari. I think we might be looking at a different document because our page numbers are a little bit different. Oh, sorry. No, that's that's <laughs> quite all right. 149. So, yes, page 100. <coughs> 149. 149. Thank you. Thank you. So, councillors, there's a recommendation that we receive the financial report and approve the adjustments to the forecast budget. So, I'd like to move that recommendation, please. Thank you, Councillor Kennedy. <laughs> Seconded, Councillor Beard. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kennedy. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and through you. Um, and thank you, Mr Bookery, for that report too. Uh, no, I have no problem with this recommendation um, that we receive the finance report and approve the adjustments. Um, I know that uh, you've got your eye on the ball and we know clearly where the variations are, occur are occurring and why. Um, the cash variance, as you say, is, is favourable to the budget at present and um, our forecast cash position remains strong um, so that's that's all good news uh, but I do want to remind everyone and I know Councillor Beard often does this is that um, all our funds are allocated and there's no spare money so we've uh, we've got every dollar uh, allocated uh, to a project or um, a service uh, so um, you know, we do have plenty of carry for forward projects to be completed. Um, we've already spoken of that. And there's new ones in the queue, and we are mindful of rising costs. But the thing is, at the present time, um, we remain on track for our annual target position of, uh, of a minimum of $5 billion, um, uh, positive, uh, or what's the proper word for it, um, surplus. Yeah, so. Um, I'm pleased to support this recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kennedy. Councillor Beard, did you have anything? Um, just thank you and through you, Madam Mayor, just a shout out to the finance team. Um, along, thank you, Mr Bacari, for the, the report and the introduction. Um, we have a great team that sit behind pulling these reports together and, and just monitoring the finance day in, day out for us. So it kind of makes our job easy, really, doesn't it? And um, thank you, Councillor Kennedy, for reminding people that we aren't cashed up <laughs> and um, that we can just afford to spend money whenever we want. We have got lots and lots of projects that are yet to um, have the soil turned over on. So um, there's some really exciting times ahead, but there's also some t tough times ahead. So having this report come to us and making, you know, knowing that the finger's being kept on the pulse continually by our, our really capable finance team um, is really reassuring. So thank you. Thanks, Councillor Beard. Councillors, anything further? All those in favour? Carried. Item 9.3 is the Tandrook Park Cobden Master Plan. Ms Love, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And through you, Councillors, a master plan has been prepared for Tandrook Park Cobden to identify opportunities and guide for future use and development of the reserve. Tandrook Park is a 2.5 hectare reserve located in Victoria Street, which is used as passive recreation space. Uh, the park boasts a rose garden, uh, garden beds, rotunda, uh, picnic and park furniture, and a path network amongst grassed areas. The master plan provides a 10 year framework and a strategic approach for the future provision and development uh, and looks to provide options to optimise participation and to promote the park and ensure that Tanderook Park um, it continues to be a valued community asset. The project was driven by a project reference group comprising representatives from local agencies, groups and the broader community and a number of key development initiatives have been identified following extensive consultation with the community. And these are outlined in the draft master plan and concept plan. It's now recommended that the draft master plan be released for public consultation during the month of November. That consultation and feedback will be reviewed by the reference group before uh, a final master plan will be presented to council in December. So the recommendation is before you. Thank you, uh, Ms Love. Councillors, recommendation 
I would like to move that, please. Councillor Beard, seconded by Councillor Macon. <laughs> Councillor Beard. Even I'm getting sick of my voice tonight. Um, through you, Madam Mayor, thank you. And um, look, this is this is an exciting project for Cobden. I just to my fellow councillors, thanks again for supporting this through the budget to have a master plan done for Tandrill Park. It's easy to always say, rush in and say, let's do this, let's do that, based on a little bit of feedback and to hope that you get it right. But a master plan certainly does help steer um, getting it right even better. Um, and the fact that the community, not only have we got a community reference group, that um, a project reference group that's been helping oversee the process, um, I think that's our our most transparent way of making sure the community is involved in the aspect of, of producing a, a master plan. Um, so we're not quite there yet. We now want to put the master plan out and see what the feedback is of this draft master plan, I should say. Um, there will be some people who may be disappointed or surprised, even somewhat by um, what the draft plan is suggesting. Um, but I can guarantee to the community members out there that we take on board everything that's said and it's it's um, brought together and then we look at trying to get the balance the best way possible going forward. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to getting further feedback from the community. I really encourage anybody out there to have a, a really close look at it, continue to ask questions um, and yeah, if you're not happy with it or you're really happy about it, make sure you let us know um, because then going forward this master plan is going to inform the projects that um, excitingly will get to carry out their at Tandrup Park over the next 10 years, hopefully some of them sooner. And that's where my um, my role comes to play, where I get to budget time and, and help um, advocate for the for work to be done um, at that park. So um, thank you again, councillors, for helping support to get to this stage and um, look forward to hearing what the community have to say. Thanks, Councillor Beard. Councillor Macon. Thank you, and through you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'd just like to echo Councillor Beard's words um, by thanking the reference group for taking the time and um, being a part of this, shaping this master plan. Um, I think it's a bit of an asset for uh, Cobden to have a, as they would like, an open and uh, uncluttered nature of, of this reserve. Um, it really adds to the assets of what Cobden has to offer. Um, with the um, nursing home across the road and making the footpaths better and everything else just makes it easier for people to meet and um, have a little bit of a tranquil, peaceful time, as they could say, with family and friends. Um, but it will be an asset for Cobden to reinvigorate this piece of reserve and um, just seeing what can be done and, and within the time frame and within budget would be, would be great to see and just seeing what the community have to say about um, about this master plan. I'm really interested, as Councillor Beard said, as to what the community has to say about it because it is your town, it is what you are wanting and you are wanting to seek out of your town. So I encourage everyone to have a say into what's going into this master plan and whether you like it or not, we'd like to hear it. Um, but yeah, I, I'm quite excited for this one, Joe, and for the town <laughs> of Cobden. Um, so I really encourage all um, all community members to have a say on this, so thank you. Thank you, Councillor Macon. Anything further, councillors? Um, Ms Love, I'm assuming the plan is out for consultation for four weeks or...? Yes, yes. Yeah, minimum of four weeks. Minimum of four November. weeks. Yeah. So as uh, the councillors have said, you know, we, we really want to hear from you, you, uh, you know, get in and have your say on, on what you think the draft plan is doing. Okay, councillors, I'll put that to a vote on favour. Carried. Item 9.4 is the October 2022 severe weather and flood events. Mrs Lindley, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, this report provides an overview of the severe weather event in Victoria over the 13th to the 15th of October, um, uh, around about two weeks ago, uh, resulting in flooding and inundation of shore and community assets. <coughs> it outlines the emergency planning response relief and recovery activities undertaken by council and provides a high level summary of the impacts that occurred throughout the Shire, not only in Skipton. A description of the timelines and actions leading into the event and subsequent responses are provided to some level of detail in the report and I won't go through them in, in that detail. But in summary, council and the community were very well prepared in the lead into the severe weather events and the resulting floods. 
Relief and recovery measures were enacted quickly and Council has already started advocacy for funding for further town improvements in Skipton, including seeking support for businesses and residents directly impacted to restore property and assets. This includes following through with commitments already made to undertake a land use structure plan for Skipton and this plan will examine all current planning controls and also look at areas that could be considered suitable for future growth and development for both residential, business and community use. Council has also previously submitted applications for funding for a shire-wide flood study and mitigation strategy and it will be important in the process of recovery to continue to pursue better outcomes for communities repeatedly impacted by adverse weather events. Madam Mayor, it's recommended that Council endorse the actions taken over the past two weeks, in particular the submission of the request to declare the event a natural disaster in accordance with the National Disaster Relief and Recovery Protocols and the suspension of the Karangamite Road Management Plan. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Mrs Lindley. And, and can I just, just speak briefly about the last couple of weeks, as, as yourself and Councillor Cole mentioned, we were able to give um, plenty of notice to the people of Skipton in particular of the the, the event because of the, the new gauges that have been installed and had really only come online um, a few days before the event. So that gave the communities time to to really to um, enact their action plans and they were able to move things out of their homes, lift things up. The businesses were able to take um, appropriate action and there was just a horde of people filling sandbags. It was, it was quite incredible that the flood came up so quickly and then went so quickly that within 24 hours we were into recovery and clean-up mode. And it was just absolutely amazing how people came out and helped. And uh, it culminated on Saturday with over 100 volunteers for our Super Saturday clean-up, not only um, within the township and around particular uh, homes and businesses, but also out on farm and the... Uh, the Skipton Football Netball Club activated and had bobcats and tractors and and uh, a lot of people helping. I'd also like to just mention, you know, the people in Skipton and we talk about resilience a lot, but they really were very well prepared and just got on with the job. And there are people, whether there's eight homes flooded or eight home, eight hundred eight hundred homes flooded, it's still a family home, and so they certainly have been affected. But what I found was heartwarming was the kids. And I've never, you know, kids are out there filling sandbags. Kids are out there sweeping the streets. Um, there were, you know, Paddy G and Caden and Tamer and a couple of others who were helping us do planting on on Saturday up at the Stewart Park where the uh, the primary school children had done a lot of planting prior to the flood and been washed out. But here were primary kids back there planting uh, again. It was just amazing, and I can't say enough about the uh, efforts of the CFA, SES. Victoria Police, but our staff, Belinda Lyle, Natalia and Angelo, and the, the uh, you know number of council staff that uh, helped out at the Relief Centre and the Recovery Centre. Um, we were a well-oiled machine, I think, including our works team, um, just all, all the agencies working together to get the best possible result that we could for Skipton. And I take this opportunity to thank councillors for making the, the time to come up to visit to talk to people, to help out at Working Bees. Councillor Cole, you gave up many days to, to come up as well and uh, I'm certainly very appreciative of the support and I know people of Skipton and staff uh, were too. So um, let's just keep our fingers crossed that Lenina doesn't have any more surprises for us. Councillors, there is a recommendation on page 214. Someone would like to move that, please. Councillor Cole, do I have a seconder? Councillor Macon, thank you. Councillor Cole. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, as we've already mentioned a couple of times, that um, uh, Skipton got a bit of a beating. Um, it's on track to recovery, but as you've mentioned, the, the, the new gauges that were put in, they said, I, I remember talking to one of the guys up there, and they said they could actually watch the peak of water coming over the gauges, which gave them. Um, an indication of where it was and how it was tracking and, and when it was going to arrive. And, and it took all the guesswork out of, actually, they said they before, in other years, they'd have to drive up there, have a look, drive back, report, Stick sticking. And, and sticking a stick in the ground to see where the water was. This gave them some actual real-time data and they knew what was coming and they knew how to prepare for it, which made a big difference. And 
Um, so all I can say is the gauges work wonderfully if we can get them further down the EMU, give other communities a bit of a chance because um, it, it travels at different rates down the down the EMU. I, I, I know I, there were some warnings given to some other farmers further down that this was happening and they were appreciative. Um, we do get a fair bit of information overload now and people switch off a bit um, and don't take them as seriously as they possibly could. Well, should give them real information and real time and and they're reliable they're not coming through a source in Melbourne or somewhere else and um, so we know what's going on um, and that that made as I said a big big difference and as I mentioned before the staff up there um, they were stretched right out um, and jobs didn't get done elsewhere but I think Skipton and, and surrounds had a bit more priority when they were in in dire needs and um, so it, people suffered a bit, they'll, they'll catch up, they, they did a terrific job up there and they've been congratulated uh, right through the whole organisation, top to bottom and it was a wonderful show of strength I think. Um, so it was, uh, I was proud to see them up there doing the job and I know a lot of the community people were very proud to see them out there working and doing jobs. Um, um, I know from one instance um, the road was washed away when the when the water went down the, the bridge was passable the road was washed away into the historical society and you couldn't get a car and you wouldn't have got a truck in there um, the road was washed away so much and one of the first things over the bridge was a truck load of gravel to put into the hole so that the truck could a CFA truck could then get in and clean out the uh, museum and historic centre um, and they were very appreciative and just small things like that as I said a lot of these things are just small things but they make a big big difference to everyone's life up there so um, the, the, the problem is not over we still have a lot of damage down the emu um, right through the community um, it will be ongoing for quite a time so um, I think people if they can just bear with everyone to let these things settle down and get back to normal, whatever normal is, and we can um, get on with it. So I think congratulations to the work, shire workers and team for a job well done. Thanks, Councillor Cole. Councillor Macon. Thank you, and through you, Madam Mayor. I think most things have been said, and I'll just echo everyone else's sentiments, statements at the moment. Um, but it was funny, we were sitting in the briefing on that Tuesday, and we got news that flood was happening, and everyone just stepped in like clockwork everyone knew their jobs everyone knew what they had to do and it was just worked like clockwork from right from andrew all the way down to to all the workers the uh, high vis people and everything like they all just knew what they had to do and i think that just shows what a great organization we have and how um well prepared we are for these things and i'd just like to thank you all again for that but being in skipton um on that day and i took my son up there he was quite in awe of all the people that are around and helping out and what the cfa and the big pole and the ses are all doing so and he couldn't believe how many sandbags were put out and everything else like that so but i, I just yeah i echo everyone else's statements and words that you all do an amazing job and and you should all be congratulated so thank you very much thanks councillor macon anything further councillor beard and councillor canady but through you madam mayor and i don't know if we should be concerned when we say we're like a well-oiled machine now when it comes to emergency because <laughs> clearly that means that we're um we're used to them but as an organization i think we have had our fair share and, and the emergency management team they really are a well-oiled well machine there's so much experience lived experience um, and as as councillor Macon said right down from from our CEO Andrew um, and thank you to Justine um, director Lindley for her work over that weekend too there was a lot happening um, so thank you for that <coughs> I actually only didn't get there till Saturday but it was pretty amazing um, to get there and just still see a lot of water laying around and I've, I'd obviously seen it all those years ago as well but to see the amount of people that had come from, well, I'm in Cobden, and we're certainly a long way away from Skipton, but there was people that I recognised in the SES uniform, um, Big Pole, um, CFA, like teams, These they're all volunteers mm -hmm. and they're giving up their time. And there was actually one of our employees who's also an SES unit <coughs> controller and he looked like he hadn't had any sleep so no doubt he was probably there on with a shy hat on and then all of a sudden he's there with an SES hat on as well and 
it's pretty amazing how our community members just jump in and have each other's backs. So um, thank you, Councillor Cole, for saying that you're proud because I think we all are. Mm. Um, and it is, it's a pretty emotional time. And it, I think with floods, you are doing a lot of the watching and, and there was a lot of unsurety around when it was going to happen, but the flood monitoring, it was amazing. And we talked about it for so long that that was going to be implemented and it really did tick a box. So that's great. It certainly doesn't soften the blow, um, but it does give us some reassurance around the flood modelling, modelling going forward and, and, and getting that preparation happening, not only from the people who live in Skipton, for the enacting of what we need to do as an organisation to get our butts up there and to be there for the community. So, um, but yeah, I just wanted to really point out the fact that the whole shire in terms of our volunteers have got in and, and they just go and help their own. So we're pretty lucky. Thank you, Councillor Beard. Councillor Kennedy. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and through you. Um, obviously a lot's already been said, so I'd, um, you know, I don't, haven't got too much more to add, but um, I do want to say that it, it was, I think it was really, um, remarkable just how well prepared the Shire was for the event. You know, they watched the data, they watched, um, kept an eye on, on the weather reports and so on. And um, I think, you know, they did everything possible to prepare and um, to minimise the impact on the residents and the and the assets um, of the Skipton, the town of Skipton. And I do want to add to that um, the emergency management team just did an incredible job, and um, I kept hearing that terminology that they're a slick machine. It was <laughs> um, mentioned a number of times, and um, it's, there's no doubt it was true. And to see to see that the emergency management team in action, you know, it was just such so smooth, so calm, and I think they were very reassuring uh, to the to the people of Skipton. You know, because quite a number of them um, have have their suffering lost and they are displaced, and you know, there was there was a lot of damage done. You know, you can't always beat what nature does. That you know, so I think that we we did well. You know, the community did well, um, and you know that this experience showed that the mitigation strategies that were undertaken post the 2011 flood event um, really were worth it. Really did make a difference. Um, just enabled a little bit more time for that preparation that was um, so badly needed. Um, you know, as I said, there are losses and you know, we've talked about the losses to agricultural businesses. Um, you know, they're further out of town and sometimes they can be overlooked, but you know, those losses um, can be hard to assess you know, on farms, but they're, they're inevitably very costly, you know, because they involve fencing and livestock and crops. Um, you know, that's a lot of money, a lot of loss um, to those business owners. Um, so I really do hope that we are successful in our application for funding um, for the for our shire-wide um, flood study and the mitigation strategy. It's sorely needed. You know, we've had um, several flooding events now, and um, it's obvious that we need um, we need that study. Um, you know, to support our community and, and be ready. Uh, as best we can, um, because it'll happen again. Um, so I, I do believe that our CEO made absolutely the correct decision um, to suspend our road management plan, um, because you know our council resources have been diverted because of this event, uh, and you know we've got such severe damage to our roads. It's going to take a very long time um, to repair those, and uh, so uh, this recommendation. Um, I support wholly. So thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Kennedy. <coughs> Councillors, is there anything further? No, I'll put that to a vote. All in favour? Carried. Item 9.5 is the slurry ceiling contract 2022-2023, Ms Love. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And through you, councillors, this report seeks to award the contract for our slurry ceiling with local roads for the uh, financial year. Slurry ceiling is a low-cost alternative to sprayed ceiling and thin layer asphalting, and which provides uh, some correction to minor road shake loss and, as a, as a result, improves the rideability uh, for vehicles. This will be the third year that we've uh, implemented this treatment. It's considered that road segments we've treated since 2020 have improved the rideability. This will be able to be assessed and validated by our condition assessments, which we're doing next year. 
It's proposed that the treatment uh, be undertaken on surfaces where there's been minor rutting and shape loss, but which don't require pavement strengthening or rehabilitation. So Council has undertaken a, com a competitive tender process to recruit a suitably qualified experienced contractor. We received three tenders. Tender, tenders. Uh, all tenders were compliant. Uh, they were submitted from experienced contractors and contractors who were pre-qualified for road surfacing works under Vic Roads or Department of Transport uh, and local content was also evident. There was a, a variance of 8% between the lowest and the highest tender prices. The lowest tender price was submitted from Downer EDI which was also 16% less than our benchmark estimate. Um, based on the tender price uh, from Downer, the cost to complete the slurry sealing contract for the year is $265,050, which is $15,050 over our budget. Um, can I please note to Council an error in the report on page 229, which states Colas Solutions is providing this contract price. That was an unfortunate uh, cut and paste from a previous report, and this should read down our EDI. Um, it's recommended that the contract be awarded in full to complete the proposed works for 2022-23, and the recommendation is before you. Thank you, Ms Love. Councillors' recommendation, Councillor Vogels, do I have a seconder? Councillor Kennedy, Councillor Vogels. Sorry, Thank you, Cole. Drew, Madam Mayor. Yeah, we'll accept the officer's recommendation. I think this has proven to be a, a, a worthy program, extending the life uh, of roads through micro surfacing. Um, it improves the rideability where minor corrections of the road surface are required. Um, it is, it's not remotely surprising in the current environment that the cost has increased and uh, it's gone over budget, but I, I think it's. Um, we can take this, we've got a buffer um, built in that we can take money out of to, to, to um, pay for this sort of stuff. Um, and this is not just something we do because, just because, because in this instance, I think it's, it is the most cost effective approach uh, and, and it'll be paid back in the long run. But thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Vogels. Councillor Kennedy. Oh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, yes, so um, there is, uh, um, an increase in the cost that was that was um, was factored in for this of fifteen thousand dollars. So um, it's that's the reality of the current market, isn't it? You know, um, it's hard to swallow, but you know, it's essential that we keep our roads in good condition, and not just for public safety, but also for economic reasons. Um, you know, with our supply chain and industry and business, so. Um, you know, and we don't want to allow our network to fall too far behind schedule either. So, I certainly support this recommendation. Um, I just noticed in the report it said that the lowest tender for this work uh, increased seven percent since last year. So, you know, it's quite a rise, and uh, I'm just grateful um, for the wisdom of the finance team um, in factoring in that. Um, that buffer into our capital works program because uh, we're going to need it. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Kennedy. Anything further, councillors? All in favour? Carried. Item 9.6 is the Cobden Aerodrome Community Asset Committee 2022-23. Thank you, Ms Love. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And through you, councillors, this report seeks to endorse the nomination for the Community Asset Committee for the Cobden Aerodrome for 2022-23. Uh, the Aerodrome Community Asset Committee held its AGM early in October and at the meeting the committee accepted nominations from an elected, unopposed, Peter Rowan as chairperson, Duncan Morris as vice chair and Bill Wood Mason and Warren Ponting as airport reporting officers uh, and also reappointed a um, number of committee members. The committee membership will enable the continued active management of an operation of this community asset. And the recommendation is before you. Thank you, Ms Love. Councillors, is a recommendation? Councillor Macon, do I have a seconder? Councillor Beard, Councillor Macon. Thank you, through you, Madam Mayor. Um, firstly, I'd just like to thank the retiring members, Anthony 
Bodie and Don McKinnon um, for all their hard work on the um, on the committee. You've, you've certainly done a great job, and we really do appreciate all the efforts and works that you do put into this, this committee. Um, I would like to thank all the committee members that are going back on again, um, especially to Peter Rowan, who has put his hand up to be uh, chairperson, which is really great, and to Duncan for being vice chair and giving um, Peter a little bit of helping hand in that role while he learns the ropes of what's happening. Um, also make note that um, there is still a couple of vacancy for community reps on this um, committee, so if anyone in the community would like to be a part of this committee, um, I would suggest you get in touch with council and let us know because the more people we have on this committee, the better, and the community really need to get involved with this because it is a community asset for them as well. Um, uh, it is great for the town of Cobden. Um, but also I do make note that um, there is a little bit of money in the 22-2023 uh, budget um, for uh, an data system fee collection, uh, which will be interesting to see how that goes, because um, it'll be nice to get that data on how many uh, aircrafts are actually landing at the airport and, um, and how many people are coming and using the infrastructure, but also to help pay for the recurring costs that we have at the aerodrome and the infrastructure to keep the aerodrome in the condition that it is at the moment and even upgraded a few bits and pieces here and there. So I'll be looking to see how that AV data system goes and um, I'll look forward to working with the committee in the coming year. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor May and uh, Councillor Beard. Oh yes, through you, um, Madam Mayor, and, and thank you, Councillor Macon, for your words. Um, and I will just acknowledge too, there's been another community member that has chosen not to recommit and that's um, Warren Ponting. Um, he's our ARO, but he's going to be an airport reporting officer as a volunteer going forward. Um, Warren was actually on this committee, I think when I started back about 11 years ago when I became the council rep, um, council law rep, I should say. Um, Warren's been a very... Uh, what can I say? He's so committed, um, very active, and he was pivotal behind the um, Pick My Project where the um, transfer pad for the um, helicopter was initiated. And, and so I, every time I think of that, I'll, I'll be thinking of Warren, and it's great that he's, he's committed to staying on as a volunteer to help with the, um, with the airport reporting role because th that is something that you do need to have trad training for. Um, it is quite a significant role and we've actually got one of the committee members here with us tonight, um, Mr Mulholland, and he would agree with me that just not anybody can rock up and do that. So it's great that Warren's still going to be able to um, do that on our behalf. As Councillor Macon said, there's quite a few um, positions vacant. I actually just counted up four. Um, we haven't had that before, so I think it's just a sign of the times which we're knowing across all our communities that volunteering is becoming tough. Um, but this is such a significant asset to not only the Cobden community, but we, we're, when we're learning more and more the amount of use that, that, that the airstrip's getting, and particularly for the transfer pad um, for the HEMS4 coming in. And, and it really is a significant asset that we really want community members to be part of in, in helping steer the direction um, and the future of, of that asset. Um, this year, particularly because we've had the wet weather, um, there's a lot of aerial spraying that's occurring and that's going to continue still for a long time yet. A lot of people, a lot of agricultural farmers just can't get on their paddocks. And having spoken to one of the ag contractors up there, he's never been so busy. So it's unfortunate that we didn't get the loading pad upgraded um, this this current um, past few months, but I mean, clearly we couldn't because of the weather. Um, but I think that's a significant piece of infrastructure that's budgeted going forward that will be um, really valued um, for not only the contractors that are using it and the, and the businesses that are providing the product, but more importantly, our farmers who get to benefit from that. Um, so there's a couple of projects that will be bubbling away, um, but a, a very committed committee, and I think Councillor Macon would agree with me with that. Mm -hmm. Very passionate and we're very grateful for them, so thank you. Thank you, Councillor Beard. Is there anything further, Councillors? All in favour? Carried. Item 9.7, the Gas Plans Community Reference Group nominations. Mr Moyne, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and through you I present Council with this report for Gas Plant Community Reference Group nominations. 
The three following companies and gas plants operate within the Shire, Beach Energy with the Otway gas plant, Cooper Energy with the Athena gas plant, and Lockhart Energy with the Iona gas plant, along with other assets that each of the companies have as well. Each gas plant has its own community reference or liaison, liaison group, which has the purpose of sharing information between stakeholders and the community. Community member positions are fixed for a two year term and have now expired in accordance with the relevant charters. Community member nominations have been sought through a publicly advertised process and councillors receive nominations to fill the uh, vacant positions, the recommendations provided before you. Thank you, Mr Moyne. Councillors, I'd like to move that recommendation. Councillor Vogels, thank you. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Macon, thank you. Councillor Vogels. Thank you, through you, Madam Mayor. And uh, thank you, Mr Moyne, who's uh, also on the liaison um, uh, meetings and, and reference group meetings with me um, and I think uh, Mr Moyne's explained it all very well. It's just a, um, it's a sort of a um, community um, and stakeholders sharing information with the gas plants back and forth. Uh, extremely handy to keep us all um, um, aware of, of what's what's up, upcoming and, and what's current. Um, so first of all I'd just like to thank all the um, members that have um, left the committees because when they've finished their term um, and, and it welcome the, um, the new people that we've got coming on the, onto the committees that we haven't had before plus the uh, people who are kind enough to put their hands up uh, to stay on the committees um, so I just um, thank you very much for having some people there I think um, it'll be interesting moving forward um, as gas is becoming um, not a future fuel but a transition fuel uh, and it'll play a very important um, part as we move forward um, into our new economy. What are they calling it? The uh, renewable? Renewable. It? renewable. So whatever they call it anyway, it has to be <laughs> <laughs> an important part moving forward. Um, so um, that be um, good to keep us in the loop of what's going on. Terrific. Thank you, Councillor Vogels. Councillor Macon. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, but I have nothing further to add. I think Councillor Vogel summed it all up, so thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> nothing further, Councillors. We'll put it to a vote all in favour. It's carried. Item 9.8 is the Health and Safety Management System Review. Mr Harrington, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, and through you. Uh, this report is to inform Council that the Occupational Health and Safety Management System has been reviewed and updated. The system is designed to comply with relevant Act, regulations and standards. The system was reviewed by an independent auditor and a number of improvements were recommended which have been incorporated into the relevant sections. The system is comprised of different elements that are detailed in the report. One of these elements is the policy which is before you for consideration. The policy has been reviewed with only minor changes to update legislative references. Mayor, there is a recommendation before you. Thank you, Mr. Harrington. Councillors, someone like to move this motion? <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Kennedy. There's only minor amendments being made. It's primarily procedural. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Macon. <laughs> Councillor Kennedy. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And yes, it is procedural, so uh, not too much to say. Um, there are no, only minor amendments. So um, the thing is that it has been reviewed uh, and um, we know that everything's uh, as it should be. In, in, the, um, in the management system, so uh, I mean, this is our health and safety, looking after our, uh, you know, the people in the organisation and um, you know, managing our human resources. So. Um, certainly don't underestimate the importance of these policies, but uh, yes, certainly adopt, I'm uh, sorry, support the recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Kennedy, Councillor Macon. Thank you and through you, Madam Mayor. Um, occupational health and safety policy is an important for everyone involved at the Kerangamite Shire. Uh, it's making sure everyone um, has a safe place to live and work, and at the end of the day, we all want you to get home to your loved ones safe and sound. Um, and the health and safety policy is developed within the contents of the wider council, Crane White Shire Council policies and relevant external policies. So it takes a lot of information to produce this document. So I thank the officers who have done this for us tonight. 
Um, I would like just to note um, that this document does cover all Korean White Shire workers in all workplaces, whether you may be um, on site at the council facilities or off site at locations. Um, whether you're an employee and a volunteer, a contractor, subcontractor, and trainee, or a student gathering information with work experience, your safety and wellbeing is important for all of us. Um, I note that one major non conformance and four opportunities for improvement identified in the 2022 audit, and I'm sure the team are well and truly onto this and making sure that they are compliant in the next action plan. So I look forward to seeing what happens in that space. Um, but also that the senior middle management lead from the top and they walk the walk and they talk the talk. So if something is wrong, that they do call it out and they lead from the top, which is really important in an organisation such as this. So thank you again to the um, officers who have produced this report and I'm happy to support this recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Macon. Councillors, nothing further? All in favour? Carried. Item 9.9 .9 is the Quick Response Grants Allocation for October 22. Thank you, yeah. Mrs Lee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Conference. sorry. Yeah. Councillor Macon has a conflict of interest. Mrs Lindley, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. The Quick Response Grants Program has a fixed budget that Council provides annually for the distribution of funds to shy community groups. The program has a rolling intake and this flexible approach allows Council to allocate small amounts of money to various community groups resulting in positive outcomes for the community. Uh, for the month of October, six applications have been received. Uh, one from the Glen Ormiston Indoor Bowls for the purchase of a new set of bowls. From the Timboon Basketball Association towards the purchase of new basketballs. The Timboon Men's Shed for the purchase of a dining table and chairs. To the Skipton Community Shop Incorporated for activities towards the Skipton's Christmas event this year. Uh, the Cobden and District Orchid Club for the purchase of a wireless all-in-one printer the, and the Camperdown Theatre Company uh, towards expenses associated with operating the 2022 Community Carols event. Councillors, please note that the Cobden and District Orchid Club allocation should be attributed to the South Central Ward, not the South West Ward. Thank you, Madam Thank you, Mrs Lindley. Councillors, so I'd like to move this recommendation. Councillor Beard, thank you. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Kennedy, Councillor Beard. Through you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Cole, for letting us have a go this week, this month. No. Um, look, um, we say it every time that it's such a, a great fun to be part of. Um, it's just small contributions that we make, um, that we get to make, that can make such a huge difference to our community groups. And there's such a diversity when you look at the applications as to what they're actually wanting and needing the money for, whether it be a community event, um, infrastructure, there's, you know, IT equipment, um, even bowls. Like, all this goes comes down to making the livability of these community groups that, bit, that little bit better. Um, so we do enjoy when it gets to this part of the meeting each month. Um, so, yeah, I just obviously, yeah, happy to move this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Beard. Councillor Kennedy. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, first of all, I feel um, utterly dreadful that I've stolen the Councillor Cole's favourite item from him tonight. <laughs> we all need to share, I think. <laughs> but no, pain. not too much more to say. Um, it's, it's clearly uh, something that the community appreciates um, highly because we always have lots of applications and um, we really enjoy being able to support our community in this way and um, to, to contribute to, as Councillor Beard said, the livability um, of, of, the, uh, of the Shire. So, uh, yeah, I love this recommendation. I'll always support it, I think. <laughs> yeah. I don't think anyone's ever voted against it, to be honest. Uh, anything further, Councillors? Any more comments? To a vote, all in favour? Carried. Thanks, Mr Mason. Thank you. Item 10 is other business. Is there any other business to be raised for the meeting tonight? No. Item 11 is open forum. Anybody, Mr. Mulholland, if you'd like to come to the 
Lipton. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, <clears throat> I understand that you've got a lot of extra money for uh, road repairs, and I think that's wonderful. And I would just like to ask that perhaps you uh, reappraise how you might spend it. And why I say that is because when you talk to all the meteorologists and scientists, they're telling us that, uh, <clears throat> as we know, the, this autumn and spring have been very wet and very damaging to the roads and that next year could well be a carbon copy of this year and that's what and it ne it's never uh, the wrong move to reappraise how you do things and I'd just like to ask you to think about it because we could be facing a worst year next year and that's why I I bring it up and ask you to think about it. <clears throat> and can I say that item 95, the slurry mix, I think that is a fantastic way of repairing roads and I congratulate you for, for taking it in hand. <clears throat> As uh, wind farms were mentioned tonight, <clears throat> I was wondering if I can give you something to think about. There's, there's part of the wind farms that no one likes to talk about and I'd like you to do your own research and make your own opinion on this, that when the wind farm is going around it causes a so sonic vibration and, it, and that sonic vibration, apart from the uh, change in the atmospheric pressure of the air, it's what destroys the whole wind uh, tower itself, it cracks the uh, tower, it cracks the uh, blades, and that's why there's hundreds of thousands of blades all around the world that uh, can't be used again because they, they've got cracks in them. And <clears throat> one suggestion is because we have a lot of wet, wet areas um, that could be put under the road for stabilisation because all around the world nobody can come up with any way of using them and they be, they're buried uh, and, and that's pretty useless to, to do that. <clears throat> and that is why with this sonic vibration, the easiest way to explain it, it's a bit like a dog whistle. A dog whistle upsets a few people but not the majority and that's why some people can live near them and other people can't. And they're the sort of things as councillors I put to you to have a bit of a think about and, and research it because nobody wants to talk about it because it is one of the worst features of wind farms. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr Maholland. Mr CEO, was there any questions or statements submitted online? Uh, no, Madam Mayor, no. nothing. Okay. Uh, with that, I will thank those members of the public who have been watching us online and I'll close the meeting. Thank you.